I don't know why my very moderate Catholic parents sent me and my sister, Jocelyn, who's two years younger than I am, to this evangelical summer camp. If I uh, couldn't make friends at school, why should I be able to make friends at summer camp? I'll admit, by the time I made it to camp uh, and got off the bus, I started feeling a lot more relaxed. Um, I was looking forward to uh, riding horses and uh, kayaking. Um, my, immediate, my immediate impression of uh, the other boys in my cabin um, weren't much. Uh, they were just a bunch of 11-year-olds. And, uh, um, and my camp counselor, Andrew, uh, he seemed a bit humorless and maybe really sad. One thing, uh, he was an albino. It seemed that not even my subconscious was enjoying itself. Um, at night, on the second night, I started doing this. I would turn over into my stomach and I'd pull, I started doing this nervous tick like this. I'd bounce my head on my wrists like this over and over again. And then because it would make my bed bunk squeak, it woke up all the other kids in the cabin. Uh, I, during arts and crafts, I let out a shameful secret uh, that I had collected 50 paperback books of the Family Circus comics. One time uh, I was waiting to take a shower and this kid was taking forever inside. And I had enough after waiting for about 20 minutes, so then I just opened up the curtain on him and said, can you please get out of the shower? Then it was finally my turn to take a shower because he finally got out. And so, as I was, uh, you know, washing my hair, minding my own business, and about to take it quickly, he opened it up on me, and then would run away. And then I would close it back. And then, seconds later, his friend would appear, and then open it on me too, and then stare at me. And then I'd close it back, and it was just back and forth for about, like, five minutes. I couldn't have a peaceful fucking shower because these little bastards. This is the beach where it all happened. Look, water. On the last night of camp, Andrew sat us at a campfire and he told us all a Bible story about a man who went to hell. And then he plucked one of his hairs out of his head and placed it into the fire to show that it didn't set on fire in hell, but instead it singed. Moments later, he told us about his troubled childhood about how he shoplifted candy bars at the age of 11. At one point at the age of 15, he contemplated suicide. And I need to remind you that uh, we're all 11 years old. And as he uh, sat on the handrail of the bridge overlooking the river, he took a pause and realized that God was flooding images of his parents and his friends crying over his death. And then he thanked God, and then got off the bridge and walked home. And he's now the person he is today, thanks to God. To be honest, there wasn't much that I remember from my second year at Bible camp. Uh, pretty much more of the same. Uh, my counselor was this, like, guy from the southern U.S. His name was Paul. Very nice, um, very kind. Um, didn't really, you know, not much of a problem with him. Uh, you know, and uh, yeah, but there was this one morning when, when we were all changing and getting ready f for the day. I, I couldn't help but notice that uh, while Paul, Paul was putting on his, his underwear that he probably had the largest penis uh, I've ever seen. I can't remember my third camp counselor's real name, but that his nickname was Torso, because apparently he liked to work out a lot. So I pissed Torso off uh, this one afternoon because I was a bit upset for losing at this game on like, on like on, on horse facts. Like I didn't get any of them right um, at the ranch. So, um, what, what, so I kicked 
the, the dirt underneath me. And then some kid claimed that some horse feces flew in his mouth. And so because I was so upset and I lost my temper, I wasn't allowed to have uh, snacks from the, 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 the canteen, which for some reason they called Tuck. It was especially painful because somehow these evangelicals were able to get cherry Coke and I couldn't find it anywhere in Winnipeg. So I'm sitting next to all my cabin mates and the counselor, Torso. And I said to him, listen, Torso, I'm really sorry, but I, I'm sorry for what I did. I lost control. Sometimes I get a little angry and I, when I shouldn't and I overreact. I sincerely apologize. And then Torso turned to me and said, let me tell you a story, Damien. There's a sinner who just arrived in hell. And he can't take the heat. He's covered in burns. He's incredibly parched. There are flames all around him. He looks up and says, God, please just give me one drop of water. I'll do anything. I'll, I'll be a better person down here. It'll, I regret everything that I've ever done to other people. Just one drop of water. And you know what God said, Damien? What, Torso? No, sorry. And then Torso went back to his ice cream sandwich. One morning, uh, we came to the dining hall here and uh, uh, we were all in line. And before uh, we, uh, we could eat, instead of singing Grace, we sang this uh, one song, Johnny Appleseed. And uh, it goes like this. The Lord is good to me, and so I thank the Lord for giving me the things I need, the fun and the food and the friends I meet. The Lord is good to me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And so immediately after we said, thank you, Jesus. Amen. This kid who was in my cabin was standing right in front of me, and he looked like he could just like tear into anybody at any time. He turns around and just immediately punches me in the stomach for no apparent reason. I was in shock. I was angry. It didn't really hurt at all. It's almost like he was trying to like hold back, but like he hit me anyway. And so I made a scene. I walked away. I decided to flail my arms up and down in the air and speak really loudly to make a big, to, to let everyone know that I was really upset about this. And so I decided to sit right here. And then Torso followed me and sat right across from me. I wanted to really show how pissed off I was. I was tired of being treated like garbage by everyone else in the camp. Well, my cabin and potentially my counselor. I hated everyone. And then Torso said to me, listen, I completely understand why you're upset. I'm upset about this too. But if you continue to um, complain about this, and it makes its way to the camp manager and his parents. Uh, it might not be so great for him because he's a foster kid. This one afternoon, I found out that my journal had been read by some of the other boys in my cabin. I didn't want to get angry. I simply wanted to let the moment pass. And maybe I could just sit through the rest of the week and not let anyone bother me. And I was sitting up here in my bunk, and a few moments later, Torso and uh, the only boy who was nice to me in the cabin started talking. Torso had to tell him that the boy's grandpa had just died that morning. And as this kid was walking out of the cabin crying, I realized maybe God was teaching me a lesson at that moment that, I mean, hear me out, maybe God killed this kid's grandpa, so then I would find out about it right after my journal was read, so I wouldn't think it was, you know, it, it, things could be worse, that my grandpa could have died. I mean, you know, he could have been seeing me upset and or he knew in advance because it had been a few hours that his grandpa was dead. And so he's like, because, you know, God can see in the future. And so he killed his grandpa. And then I would have my journal being read. And then I'd find out. And then I would see, like, the, kid's the kid finding out. So then I would learn a lesson. 
I mean, Grandpa was on his on de at death's door anyway, so I mean, why not? Like, On the last day, Torso sat me down by the lake. He asked me if I had God in my heart, if God was someone I truly believed in. This actually set off the complete opposite. What if God doesn't exist? And if God exists, how do I know if God's in my heart? I kind of was in this like weird panic mode. I I didn't know what to do or say. And then I told him I wasn't entirely sure. He then told me, well, Damien, this is your last day at camp. And think about it. You might be in Winnipeg, just walking down the street. And what if a bus hits you and then you died? If you didn't accept God into your heart at this very moment, I can't really say what might happen to you after you get hit by that bus? I knew I had to get out of the situation quickly. So I had to put on the best performance of my life. I looked down. I took a deep breath. I looked back at Torso and said, Yes, I can feel that God has entered my heart. Torso said that it was a beautiful moment that he just witnessed. A few hours later, when my parents came to pick me up, Torso handed my mother a certificate that I officially accepted God in my heart on this day in August, 1995. On the way back from camp, um, my parents took my sister and I to Boston Pizza for, uh, for, for dinner. Uh, so. On the way there, um, I decided to pick up the Bible, and um, about four pages in, I couldn't understand why everyone lived to about 950 years old, and how Adam and Eve only had two sons. So about four pages in, we get to Boston Pizza, and uh, we're there. We order. My sister tells us uh, that she asked her counselor if uh, uh, it, it was okay to be gay. And then her counselor told her, well, I'm not going to say anything, but God did make Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Towards the end of the meal, um, there, was a U, uh, there was this U2 CD on the sound system that, that started skipping. And you could just hear Bono sing this one note like, <laughs> for about seven minutes. We just looked at each other, my family and I, like, ah, 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 ah. and then uh, finished our meal and went home. And I don't think I ever picked up the Bible ever again. Bible camp memories are waiting for you. Bible camp memories for me and for you. Bible camp memories a crew and a crew. Jesus, he loves you.